Mark, biggest difference between being a millionaire and a billionaire? What would you say? The difference, like the difference between having a hundred dollars and a thousand dollars, or a dollar, you know, or a penny and a thousand dollars. It's no difference. No, no, no. It's a huge difference. I mean, I've I've been I've been blessed. I mean, I made a lot of money at a relatively young age, um, and was a millionaire a few times over. Mm-hmm. But just in terms of what you can do and the opportunities it buys, there's no comparison. At the billionaire mark. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just it's crazy. Now, how, how do you stay so so uh, so humble? I mean, you you got to be the coolest cat in entrepreneurs. Everybody, people who follow you. You got a lot of opinions. You're no, not going to hold back I'm on opinions. Dick, you just don't know it. Yet. <laughs> you're a dick. I just talk, don't know it. Talk to me a little bit well, longer. I'm sure behind closed doors, <laughs> I see your interviews sometimes. You know, you don't yeah. hold back. But still, you, the level of the, the one thing that always impresses me with you is uh, because sometimes you know how guys get to a higher level. They, they, they have so many people. That, hey, Mark, can you give me money? Can you give me money? Can you do this? You still are very accessible. Mm-hmm. How do you balance that accessibility and still running all the businesses you run? Well, people, you know, that I'm close to, I know what's going on, and so it's it's really easy, you know. And if I don't know you, you know, reach out to me on Cyberdust, and I've got 30 seconds to decide whether or not I want to know you. You know, I don't do a lot of meetings. I don't do a lot of phone calls. Um, I don't do a lot of sit-downs. I do almost everything through Cyberdust or email, and that makes me a lot more efficient and gives me a lot more time. In terms of people wanting things, you know, it's the best problem in the world to have. And so I try to be nice. I try to be considerate. Um... But, you know, pe- people who know me know what's important to me and what's not, and either you fit in that or you don't. That's good to know. And, you know, I finished your book, and I watch a lot I'll of your interviews. I'll pages of it. The, 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 <laughs> the book is, it's, but you know what, the one part in your book with the edge, yeah. I think every entrepreneur needs to read that. No, it's true. It's Literally, true. I think every entrepreneur, needs, even if it's just the edge part. Well, that's why I made it so short and sweet, right? I want people to see stories. I wanted people to see, you know, that if I can do it, they can do it. Um, and I don't want to get them all bogged down in, you know, this little story or that little story and try to, you know, try to sound smart or be smart. I figured, you know, the things that have worked for me and the things that I use to, to motivate myself, if I could keep it short and sweet, people would actually read it. And, you know, I get comments all the time. This is the first book I've read in years, and I read it all in one sitting, and that was my goal. And, and it gets a lot done in the one sitting. Yeah, and it's, it's something idea. that gets a lot done in one sitting. Okay. And for four bucks, you can afford it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so if you haven't read about it, if you're watching, you've got to get the book. It's one of the action items at the end. Mark, so question. I read the story, you know, the whole $7,500 ring, the 83000 the 85000 the whole, right. you know, the, the, the motley 18-year-old and then the 16-year-old, 16-year-old plus yeah. all that stuff that you have. But I'm curious, if, if you and I were buddies in high school, uh-huh. say we're 14 years old, 15 uh-huh. years old, and we know each other, uh-huh. would I bet on you being who you are today? No chance. Really? No chance. Tell me why. I mean, I had my, I had my good friends, and, you know, we, we hung out, and I was a hustler. There's, there's no question I was a hustler. And, and Even in high school? Oh, yeah, and into business in a big way. Um, but I don't, I don't think people saw to me. It wasn't like people looked at me and go, oh, he's, he's destined to succeed. Um, I'll show you a picture of me in high school when we leave. I'm not going to let you take a picture of it, um, and you'll see why. <laughs> really? Yeah. Now you got everybody curious. You want yeah, to see well, the picture? You can describe it, but, yeah, I'll, I'll show it to you. Um, but, yeah, I'm not going to let you put it on camera. No worries. <laughs> we, we will not do that. So, so in high school, you were the fun guy. Were you, were you, were you always the, the guy that made people laugh? Were you no, very competitive? I was, just, were you the I was, I was guy? always were you competitive. The I, was, guy? I was into sports. Not, I wasn't great at it. I was just decent. Um, wasn't a technology guy. I mean, I, I was into learning. I was, I was, I was a business guy. I was, I was the guy reading about business all the time, reading business books all the time. You know, going to junior achievement. I was a junior achievement geek. Um, Why though? Why were you reading business books? Because I want. That's what I knew. I mean, I was wired that I was. You know, I started my first business when I was twelve. I was buying and selling um, baseball cards, buying and selling stamps, anything I could do to make money. I, w- I was hustling and trying to do. So, I was into business, but I, I not so much where it was. All my friends were into it with me, so they wouldn't know. And baseball so, cards. Yeah, baseball cards, you name it. I mean, I grew up in Pittsburgh, and so I would, probably even less than 12 years old, I would, excuse me, go out and buy a bunch of baseball cards that I collected, and I would package, I would say, okay, you're guaranteed to have a Pittsburgh Pirate in this package, and I would charge three times as much, and I'd set up on this park bench down in the park down in Scott Township where I grew up, and um, I'd have these little sales, and it was great. I made money, and I, I mean, it was you know, and I, I learned as much about business when I was nine, ten, and twelve as I, I learned any other time. 
I'm, I'm obsessed with baseball cards. Do you, do you still, is, there, is there any that you no, really, I wish really I still like did. or no? I, no, I wish I still had them, yeah. <laughs> but they're all long gone. I give them to my brother. Who knows what happened to them? Something about cards, man. I don't know what it is. You explain it to somebody, they think you're nuts. Well, back then, was that was something. how you learned. Yeah, back then, that's how you, you, know, you had your favorite players, and you, know, you didn't see – they weren't on TV every day. You only read about them in the newspaper. There was no internet. And so baseball cards were a way to connect. You know, I had my Willie Stargell. I had my Roberto Clemente cards. So you you're know. talking about – you're Way back about, when, yeah. yeah. There was no Beckett back then, right? Yeah, so, um, Beckett was just getting started, right? So, you know, I didn't look at it more. I looked at it just, hey, this is the home affinity. It wasn't like, okay, these were going to be valuable at some point. Um, so, yeah, but it was just, you know, it was just a means. Yeah, now that you have the Hannes Wagner card. Yeah, I, I could, you know, I thought million, about, yeah. That'd yeah. be a cool card to Yeah, have, but right? I, I've just, I mean, just look look around you, right? I mean, I got stuff. I'm, I'm just not into, like. I'm not a big collector type guy. Well, I got you a gift, man. I, I'm, I'm going to give it to you, it. and I wanted to get you something. And what can I get this guy? He, you, you may have it, but I hope you don't I have, have it in your life. I, so I, I probably <laughs> have five of them. So, so let's get into entrepreneurship a little uh -huh. bit. We already have, but I, you know, going into it now to focus on that a little bit. What would you say, out of all the reasons in the world, and I've read your book, you have the 10, you know, all these keys to success, et cetera. What would you say is the number one reason why people fail? Not necessarily why they make it, the complete opposite. Right, lack of brains, lack of effort. Lack of brains, lack of effort. Yeah, they just they don't do the work. They don't learn. You know, when you walk in the room, when you start a business and you start to talk about somebody, you're you're never in a vacuum with no competition. You know, unless you're just extremely lucky. And if there's going to be competition, that means somebody else knows your business as well as you do when you get started. And if you walk into a competitive environment and they still know more about the business than you do and more about your customers, you're going to lose. And, but most people don't consider that. They don't do the work. They don't learn more about their industry. They don't know even about their business. I mean, and so you've got to put in the effort to know more about your industry than anybody else. Um, and that's, that's the brains part, and that's the effort part as well. Because, look, if you're competing with me, you, you better know what you're doing. Otherwise, I'm going to kick your ass, you know, and you're not going to outwork me. And so, you know, the combination is usually what kills businesses early on more than anything. Do, do you think so? Now, there's a part that people say, you know, uh, Mark made it because Mark is a special guy and he became an entrepreneur. He made, you know, this guy made it. All these guys made it because they have this special gene or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a proven formula that if a brand rookie guy, he's got a lot of ambition, he's got a lot of desire, but not a lot of knowledge and how to. Do you think if he follows a formula, he's guaranteed to make it as no, an entrepreneur? No, no, no. Okay, no so you don't believe there's a guarantee no, to make it? No, because who knows who you're going to be competing with? So if you put two two people both following the same formula, both in the same industry, right? Which one wins? You know, maybe they both can win and both be successful. But you know, so I don't I don't think there's a default default template for success. But I think there's things that you can do to put yourself in the best position to succeed. You know, so I, I talk about stuff in the book. You know, I talk about the one thing in business you can control is effort. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, going out there and sales curing all. You know, so I, I think you know, and, and I agree with your point that. There are things that if you do them, you put yourself in the best position to succeed. But you know, if you just walk into a buzz, you know, a buzz saw and somebody else is doing them a little bit better, you know, it happens. Now, are you saying to to compete at your level? There's no way. Or just or just any level, right? Just any so level. So even if you put a formula for me, I followed it. Will I eventually be able to make a quarter million a year if I followed a plan? That I put? I'm not talking about a hundred million. Yeah, a but billion. you got to pick where too, right? Right. right. So I was industry wise, at, right? Yeah, I was okay. at a business plan competition and they were talking about making big money reselling travel plans and making three dollars in affiliate commissions right it's just not going to happen you have to That's be smart point. you have to be yeah. smart you can pick the wrong things and you know you're talking you know alluding to earlier about entrepreneurs being born or built you know and i think they're i knew i was wired to be excited about business how or why i don't know but you know and there's certain guys that have the genetics to jump out of the gym mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. there's certain guys you know that you know, when they golf, they have the muscle memory and, and the discipline. You know, Dirk um, Nowitzki may not be the most talented guy in the NBA, but his discipline and his focus to do what's necessary to be successful, he's willing to do and combine it with being seven feet tall and being skilled, you know, it makes him an amazing basketball player. So it's, it's understanding what your skill set is, finding the right place to use those skills, and then going for it. You know, will that make you 250 grand? It depends if you pick the right industry. But whatever industry you pick, if you outwork everybody, if you try to be a little smarter than everybody, if you try to be a better salesperson than everybody, if you try to be better prepared than everybody, you've got your best chance. Because if you don't do it and somebody else does, 
you know, I, I have the saying, work like someone's trying to take it all away from you. You know, work, mm-hmm. I actually work like mm-hmm. someone's spending 24 hours, working 24 hours to take it all away from you. Mm-hmm. And, and that's kind of the way I look at it. When you were younger, did you have, was your father into business? Was your mother, was uh-huh. there an uncle, somebody that did well in business that mm-hmm. you admire? Was there somebody you read about that you said, I like Rockefeller, or I like no. Carnegie? Nothing. Nothing. So nothing. it was just purely you just, that you had yeah, business? Yeah, my dad, in. I think, you know, my dad did upholstery on cars. My mom um, sold, did whatever odd jobs. Um, but my dad was always like, if you want something, you have to earn it. And to his credit, he never said, no, you can't do that. So whether it was selling garbage bags, baseball cards, stamps, whatever it was, he, he never held me back. And so I think that was as important as anything. And, you know, sometimes being young and trying things, you're so naive and you don't know any better. All you do is learn. And if you fail, it doesn't matter. And so whether I was 9, 10, 12, 16, 21, the failures were irrelevant. And, you know, whether you're, you know, 9, 12, 16, 21, 22, 24, you know, I'm sleeping on the couch. You know, I have a car with a hole in the floorboard. You know, I'm, I'm living like a bum and, and like a student. And so what did I have to lose? And so I think that influenced me as much as anything. So, it was, you know, my dad was like, go for it. You know, don't, why not? What have you got to lose? You know, you have to sleep on a different couch. So I think that that was motivation as much. So you had the encouragement from yeah, father, sure. support, go do it. Yeah, go so, do it. so do you think like, let's just say if we put 10 guys here, you interview them. Mm-hmm. Okay. You could within a five, 10 minute, minute interview say, this dude's not going to make it as an entrepreneur. Could you pretty much know that? You know, I'm not very good at, at, at interviewing. The, the issue is my interview skills more than, <laughs> really? you know, I'm horrible Isn't at it. Isn't Shark Tank interviewing? No, well, yeah, interview. it is, but I get to do due, due diligence after the fact, right? So I get Got to play it. my inches, but I get to Got check. It. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can typically tell, right? I can tell um, but by um, their passion. I can tell by their focus. I can tell by their preparation. You know, there, there's a whole realm of things in any business. Here, you know, here's here's the business you're in, and here's a thousand things that influence whether or not you're going to be successful. And really, to me, by, you know, through my experience in businesses, I can put myself in his position and say, okay, here are 900 of the thousand things he has to be aware of, and then go through and ask. And by how many of those or her um, issues they've been able to address already, that kind of gives me a sense of how hard they're willing to work. You know, and I can tell by the questions they ask me. So all I have to do is say, okay, what do you want to know? And, you know, when they start saying, what should I do? They ask you. Yeah, well, you know, and that's fine, right? And I want them to ask questions, but, you know, people like to say, you know, the only stupid questions are the one you don't, ones you don't ask, and that's not right, right? Because the questions you ask tell, every, tell me, tell whoever more about you than anything else you do. Because in particular, it tells me about your preparation. If you ask me questions about just basic things that you should have known and you should have down to a science, that's going to disqualify you almost more than anything. I read the cyber desk you sent out, by the way. But, I, but the question, I said, I said okay. man, i got to get the questions right with this guy. <laughs> yeah, <true. laughs> right, that's, so you know, I read it. I said, okay, I'll take that as a challenge. And that's what I was cyber dust. I'll blast yeah. out like when I have a thought. That was right? great. Yeah. yeah so, that yeah. was phenomenal. What, the questions you asked are critical. I agree. It's, it's complete opposite on the way you, you know, the traditional way of thinking. Yeah. And I always ask the question. So, uh, Mark. You're now, you know, whatever your net worth is, billions of dollars. You own a sports team. You have businesses. You're on Shark Tank. You're on TV shows. Everybody wants your time. Mm-hmm. How hard is it for you now? This is the thing I think about. Because for my side, I run a business. It's harder for me to make friends now mm-hmm. and let people in my circle. But I'm not at your level. How is it when a person like you, is it still easy to make friends now? Yeah, is but it I'm not out there. You know, at this or, point, I'm not out there looking. You know, I don't need any new running buddies. I mean, my high school buddies are still my friends. My college buddies, my it. rugby buddies, um, the guys I when I first came to Dallas that were my friends then are my friends now. Um, I, you know, I've got three kids. You know, so it's more. You know, my my family just takes up so much of my time along with business. So I'm not. You know. And, and even back in the day when I was single, I was still successful. I could tell the gold diggers from the, the real friends. I mean, you know, it, it was pretty easy. Got it. Did association play a big role with you or not really? No. Nah, not no, really for you? Yeah. Because you mean, were so determined it didn't matter. Nobody could influence you, influence other people. Yeah, I just, I just went and did my thing. Makes sense. Makes sense. A um, couple words I'll just put out there. I want to see what you think about it. Because um, I watch you and I watch some of these other guys and I see a sense of paranoia. And I don't know if you read the book, The Only the Paranoid Survive. Yeah, I don't know, but I'm familiar with 10, 20, it. Yeah. Great yeah. book that was written. Do you think there needs to be a healthy level of paranoia? Oh, absolutely. There needs to be. Oh, yeah. I okay. mean, I always say, you know, for every one of my businesses, I, I say, what would I do to kick my own ass? 
you right? So whatever business you have, there's somebody trying to put you out of business. There's somebody trying to, to take a bite out of mm-hmm. your business. Mm-hmm. And it's better for you to figure out how they're going to do it rather than they do it. Um, and so, yeah, that's being paranoid. And so you have to be paranoid. You have to anticipate other people's next move and moves. And you can't ever, you know, downplay the competition. You know, I was telling, um, I was at a business plan competition this morning for, at a college and they were kind of being dismissive of the competition. And so you can't ever do that. You know, they're out there trying to take you down and they're not just going to sit still. And if you're good, really, really good, you're going to inspire them to work even harder, faster, better. And so you have to be, you know, very self-aware of what you're good at and what other people are good at. And, you know, a healthy dose of paranoia makes a big difference, is very helpful. Uh, so that, that's interesting you say that. So sometimes, you know, you're, you're being a little bit too paranoid. You know, you're, you're being too concerned about this, too concerned about that. The other question for you would be, uh, Mark, you don't run one company. You right. run many companies. You're doing deals all the time. And there is this notion that you hear multitasking. Right, um, you mm-hmm. can't multitask. You can't do this. So your brain, if I were to take 100 percent of the 10 percent here, 7 percent here, 6 percent here, how do you process all of it here in your mind with the different responses? That has to be something that I'm really good at, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I just I process things very quickly, and that's always been my strength. I, I can I can identify what's going on typically faster than anybody, and and grind right through it. And plus, you know, I, I because I force everybody to email or cyber dust. It's all coming from one flow, right? It's, it's all one funnel. And so I'm not bouncing from meeting to meeting thinking, okay, what did we say in that meeting? Mm-hmm. We're having to take notes and mm-hmm. then we're having somebody take notes. You know, it's like it's already in writing. It's in an email. And if it's in Cyberdust, it's like having a face-to-face. And when I see it, I respond to it immediately. Cyberdust forced me to respond to it immediately. Um, and so that that allows me to, to keep things organized and, and stay on top of things. And, you know, so, you know, Anything that's unread, that's my to-do list, and, and that's how I stay on top of it. Got it. Um, so I, I've become a fanatic cyber dust. Good, There's in a, every other hour I'm checking cyber. When you told me, you know, go check out cyber dust, and then from there, I, we got everybody on the company. Now everyone out here, the only way you're going to get to see this first, got to go on cyber dust. And I'm going <laughs> like to put the it. link out. We'll do one of like the mentions it. to get everybody Absolutely. on there. But I love the product, and we'll get to that because I want to explain how I see cyber dust, sure. not as a CEO, as a customer, because uh-huh. I, I want people to see how I see it as a customer. Let's talk about speed. Uh-huh. When people ask me and say, hey, you know, h- how do I get speed going? I want to see your perspective on this because um, CyberDust has a tipping point. You know, you got Twitter right. has a tipping point. Right. Facebook has it. Everything is about the tipping point. In your mind, um, how does one entrepreneur increase the speed in areas that they can increase? There are certain things you can't control. Speed in one way. Speed of growing your business. All right. So, so how fast can I grow? Yeah, I mean, it just depends. You've got to know your own skill set, right? And you've got to know how that fits within your company's life cycle. Um, you know, some companies are slow, slow grind, and you just have to understand that, and you've just got to bide your time and still – it, until it starts to click and then grow with it quickly. You know, if you're trying to release a product that needs to be ubiquitous, you've got to go um, as fast as you can and, and then, you know, release hope, a product. Yeah. Like a launch. Yeah. And, and, you know, there, there's a lot of people who say, you know, perfection is the enemy of profitability. Right. And that doesn't mean you have to wait to us a perfect product. You know, CyberDust is a perfect example. We still haven't. It's been almost two years. We still haven't advertised it yet Mm -hmm. because we know it's not ready yet. You know, and so it's been a slow growth grind because that's we want it. We want feedback. You know, we want to keep on learning. Um, We're we're evolving. Um, But it it really just depends on what the product is it, you know, a a barbershop. Right. Is it an app? Is it um, a service? Is it a product? But, you know. The, the key is looking for the low hanging fruit. What are the what are what customers are willing to write you a check or commit to it, you know, so that they're willing to integrate it into their daily lives or integrate it into their daily business. And so getting a commitment either through time or revenue is typically what I look for. And so if I can get a commitment, then I'm, I'm going to be able to learn. I'm going to see how they use it. Do they sustain usage? And then once I get the next one, you know, hopefully it came a little bit faster than the first mm-hmm. one. Then I can ask for referrals and then the next one, then the next one. And I just try to ramp it up. You know, when I bought the Mavs, we, we had no season ticket holder base. And so literally it was a, a matter of just putting a list of former season ticket holders in a white pages back then, you know, on my desk next to my phone and making phone calls. You? Yeah, me. 
Yeah, because if I'm not going to do it, how can I expect someone amazing, else to do me. it, right? So just get on the phone. Hey, this is Mark Cuner. I'm the new owner of the Dallas <laughs> Mavericks. Unbelievable. You know, I'd like to invite you back for a game. It's not, though. This is my business. But you, 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 we can't get regular sales guys to something make those calls once they get to a quarter. You, you're a guy yeah. that's a billionaire. You're making those well, calls. No, but that's all, you know, and that's fine and good, right? Because everybody's got their own goals, right? And But still, I, I don't want anybody at the Mavs to be able to say, well, he's not willing to do the work, right? There's... You know, if I walk around, I'm picking up all the papers. I'm not saying go get that picked up. I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, that's trash. I'm picking it up. Um, so, but in terms of speed of growth, it, it's really you got to get that first customer first, and then when you get that first, what did you learn? Reiterate, get that next customer, and then hopefully, as you learn more and more through the process, then the next one, the next one, the next one becomes comes by even faster. You know, it's interesting when we walked in here, and I appreciate that on the speed side. When we walked in here, typically when I want to know. How it is to work for somebody? I, you've got to ask people around them. Right? You can't ask the person how's it to work right, for you. You can't right, even get yeah. the right answer. So I asked the security guy. This guy said, "Oh, you know, Mark comes. He's going to say hi to everybody. He's going to do this. He's going to do that." And they were all like, "Fan, they love working." That's because we have cameras and microphones. <laughs> <laughs> so they see all their work. On what they do. <laughs> That's classic. That's classic. Okay, let's transition to a different subject. Let me see uh-huh. the time. Okay, let's transition to a different subject with college. Uh-huh. You went to IU, yep. right? Now, you got a lot of people that uh, say, uh, forget about school. You know, they're drop idiots. out of school. They're, they're idiots. So you think they're, they're idiots. idiots. Tell me why. Um, if you're going to have and run a business, if you don't understand accounting, you're already behind the eight ball. Can't you hire a guy that's, that knows how but to run But then they, they still have to communicate to you. Right. I mean, there's people that don't understand the, the concept of, you know, the difference between profits and cash. You know, oh, your accountant might tell you you're profitable, but your cash is going down, you know, not understanding um, the breakdown. And, and when you don't. You think you need college to learn that? Yeah, I think you do. Right. Because it, it may not for some people. Look, if you're so self-motivated that you can take an online course in accounting and teach yourself everything, you're way ahead of the game anyways. But most people aren't. And I'm not saying you have to go to Indiana. I'm not saying go to an expensive school. I don't care if you go to a community college and take accounting and, and spend 99 bucks for the class. Just, you know, spending the money forces you to be more obligated to do it. But accounting, finance, lesser extent marketing, sales at the school offers that. These are all the, that's the language of business. And so while it's possible to teach yourself these things and while it's possible to hire them, mm-hmm. when you're starting your own company, you don't want to have to spend money hiring an accountant. Right, you're already probably going to have to hire a lawyer to set up uh, your your. Well, let me take that. If you've gone through all these classes, you probably don't have to hire a lawyer to incorporate. Right, you probably figure it out yourself. And so your cost of opening up a business drops. But even more important than all that, that's that's the blocking and tackling. That's the language of business. You know, the thing I learned at Indiana that was more important than anything else, I learned how to learn, and learning became far more important to me because the one certainty in business is that it's always going to be changing. The if, if you're not always learning, if, to this minute, if, if I'm not continuously learning, if I'm not just absorbing as much as I can absorb, someone else is going to kick my ass, right? So you talk about paranoia. The, the greatest source of your paranoia should be knowledge. If someone else knows more than you do, and if you're not learning, if you don't know, the lear- if you don't know how to learn, if you don't have a thirst for learning and acquiring information, you're, you're SOL. Do I need to go to school to have that, though? So maybe, maybe let me restate the question. Okay. Here would be the question. The question would be, do I need to get a bachelor's degree? So what you just I don't, said. I don't see necessarily you have to have the degree. Okay, fair right, enough. So, then, right, I got you it. have to have the knowledge. Totally. I, I totally agree with that. Fair enough. Okay, so let's skip that part and go into a little bit of politics. Uh-huh. And, you know, our conversation started. I said, Mark, you know, I said, man, you got to get up there because <laughs> you got such a big fan base. People want to hear your opinions about politics. You may want to run for president one day. And we were going back, back with the whole forth, thing, yeah. and I said, man, people got to know, who is, what is Mark thinking about? Because a lot of times CEOs don't want to touch politics. Right. They don't want to touch it at all for whatever reason. Um, if you were the president today, Mark uh-huh. Cuban is the president, February 1st, 2016. What are three things you're attacking? Um, income inequality, right? Um, improving the ability for um, companies to raise capital. Through IPOs, I think that will have a big impact on the market. Gosh, You've touched yeah. that on Inc. So you said yeah. that on the Inc. as well. So let's talk about income inequality. I'll just sure. do that one. So how do you do that? So right now, let's just say you're making um, $35,000 a year, mm-hmm. and you're clearing 1500 bucks a month after tax. Okay. And you live like a student. I don't care if you're 30, 40, 50, whatever. Sure. You're living like a student, and you're able to save 500 bucks a month. 
okay? Or you sleep, you're staying at home, you're living at home, right? With your 80 year old parents, mm -hmm. right? And you're mm -hmm. 50 years old. Um, There's a lot you, of that right now. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. And so you're saving six grand a month, right? Well, right now with interest rates near zero. Six grand a year. Or six grand a year, yeah. right? Number. right. Um, so you're saving six grand a year, 500 bucks a month, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. That's what every Republican wants you to do. That's what every Democrat wants you to do. Try to control your own destiny. Now you put it in the bank or do you put it in stocks? No one trusts the stock market. No one really knows what they're doing, mm -hmm. right? Now you put it into a fund. But the problem is if you put it into a fund, because you're not making a lot of money, if the dishwasher breaks, right, you get penalized for taking sure. that money out. So we're, we're in a situation right now where it's, it's, if you put that money into the bank, which is really only the safe way, you know, 6000 a year, and a year you'll have – Six thousand and sixty dollars. Right. Sure. You're just not ever going to be if that. If that, right? And the point being is, you're never going to improve your place in life, right? Where the one percent really, the reason income has become so un unequal, is I can hire anybody I want to help me pick the best investments. Now, I do most of it myself, mm -hmm. but I'm decent at it, right? So I can put my money in stocks. I can put my and hedge against the risk. I can put my money in whatever, but I'm liquid, so I don't have to worry about the dishwasher breaking. Got right? it. If you have $6,000, how are you going to keep up, right? How are you going to improve your position in life? Even if you spent 20 years saving $6,000 a year, that's $120,000, but you've earned $1,500 in interest that whole time, right? And while $120,000 is good, you're not going to be able to live off of that when you hit 65 or 70 years old, right? Not at all. So part of the challenge is how do you allow people to accumulate capital okay. without the risk of waking up one day and not being able to get the money out for their dishwasher mm -hmm. or their car or paying for their kid's school, right? Or, not, um, or finding that the stock market is way down and they're basically wiped out. And so, to me, that's the first thing to address. And so, I think, you know, one way is the Federal Reserve. I don't think you mess with the Federal Reserve, but I think you come up with savings certificates, savings bonds that literally pay a little bit more that allow people to save for their future because I think that helps people protect their future. That allows people to build more of an asset base, and that takes them, you know, gives them a comfort level that – um, they're going to be able to survive as, as they age and take care of their expenses. And maybe then maybe they can buy a house. You save up enough money, earn enough in, in interest or whatever it may be to buy a house. But you just, you know, it's not so much pulling the top down as in bringing the bottom up. And then I would also increase the minimum wage. And the way I would, there's a couple different ways to look at it. But in my mind, like this past December, we gave everybody here a raise to a minimum of $10 an hour. And the reason I did it is, I found out there were people that worked for me that were on government assistance in one way or another. You know, it might be a program, but I, I hate the idea that I'm subsidizing somebody, you know, the fact that I'm not paying enough, everybody's taxes is subsidizing this person's life. You know, you think about that. And so you get a lot of business owners saying, oh, you can't raise the minimum wage. Well, all of us pay for the fact that you're not paying that person enough. And will it change the competitive balance? Well, if everybody's having to pay more, then the competitive balance still stays somewhat competitive. Will the markets change some? But it's not so much that I think raising the, the, the minimum wage is a great idea, but what I don't like is the fact that we are subsidizing low wages for certain for, for businesses. And so I think, you know, maybe there's a better way than minimum wage. I'm just talking off the top of my sure, head. Sure, of course. But at the bottom line is that people who work for me shouldn't have to use government services funded by everybody. And until we can get people off of that, income inequality Interesting. is just going to be kind of convoluted. Your approach will be to government doing something about it. To, well, it's not so much the out. government doing something about it. I want to get people off of government assistance. Got it. Right. So, so how about this part? You know, there used to be time when the whole Ford Motor Company came out with, you know, Work nine to five, and when they came out with this after the Great Depression, you know that's right. when the nine, nine to five is only a ninety year old system, right, ninety year old system, yeah. right? So when they came out with that, you and I said, okay, I'll give you thirty years of my life, and then for you know we said, hey, but what are you going to give me if I give you thirty years of my life? So they said, we'll give you a pension, pension plan. Right. In nineteen eighty four, we have one hundred thirty something something pension plans, thousand, one hundred thirty some thousand pensions. Today we have twenty four. Right. I think we've gone away from that because. Uh, it sounds like from what your concern is on income inequality is the first point you made is $500 a month times 12 months, $6,000, so long-term 20 years, $120,000, which means they may not have long-term money for retirement. But if we go away from the pension plan, 
So do the we problem figure with, out a way to the incentivize problem with companies? Well, the problem with pensions is the uncertainty of business, right? So what's happening with pensions now, sure they've got to grow them just because to, to support the amount of money required for the employees, they, they, can't, they can't find that return, right? So if, if, I either got to, if everybody's earning, only earning 1%, and your pension matches your salary, mm -hmm. okay? Just for the, and you're making thirty six thousand sure. dollars a year. Okay. I've got to find a way as a business owner to fund thirty six thousand dollars per year, for the, you know, so that you're making over the, twenty or seven yeah, twenty. So right, you're doing right, math right. for that sixty five to eighty five. Yeah. So, right. but but if you're only earning one percent, the rule of seventy two says it takes seventy two years, 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 right? right? Yeah. So I've got to you know you don't get seventy two mm -hmm. years. So I've got to fund three quarters of it or whatever. So w would it be with the solution? Would be you know we can move away from this topic. Would it be given an incentive for companies who do give pension plans up to this? Point? I just don't. I don't think companies mathematically. Don't yeah, think I it just, yeah, I don't think it works simply because there's too much uncertainty on the earning. The, 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 key of it, the key of it is what, what elements of certainty do you um, put on businesses, right? A pension is a certain amount that you have to pay, but you're, it's uncertain how much you're going to earn. You know, if, whether it's minimum wage or some other way of, of doing it or, you know, working so that whatever it is, right, so that you don't need government assistance, then that's just part of your current business. You know, and so it's really, I guess it's more about coming to you or I as a business owner and said, okay, if you're making a million dollars a year, would you be okay with making $750,000 a year? And so you, know, you tack on another 250 on the tax? Well, no, whatever, saying, no, whatever not, not tax, not tax, no, okay. not tax. A way to say to you, why don't you pay your guys more? Right? Got it. That's what you're saying. You know, a guilt type thing, right? You know, and so, you know, I've said... I've Would it really be a government, government no, enforced no, thing? No, no, you, no, no. Like a crusade no. type of thing. Yeah, okay, you let's say, go well, out there and do this. Like yeah, how much more money do you need, money right? Back. Yeah, how much more money Got do you need? I'm not saying... Look, I, I've literally I written... see that happening, though. Yeah, I've, I've literally written checks to the, the Dallas City Treasury. You know, when the Mavs won a championship, I paid for the parade. When we needed extra um, police overtime, I wrote the check for it. Because it's not fair to ask all the citizens of Dallas to pay the taxes for something that benefits me like that. Would you consider yourself a capitalist? Oh, oh, you're absolutely. Full on, you're full-on capitalist. Oh, yeah, but see, what, what's changed with capitalism, it, I mean, I'm a hardcore capitalist. We're not a full-on capitalism. You know that. We're no, not we're not, though, but we've right. evolved, right? And so, you know, 90 years ago, the Henry Ford days. Sure. If you didn't have a job and you couldn't afford it, you found somebody's floor to sleep on, and you went with your family or whatever, you know, um, and if it was 12 to a room, that's the way it was. Mm. And then over time, we started having, you know, you know, with, with FDR, um, we started having, you know, basic services that we would provide for you. And then over time with LBJ, it was more services, right, and, and welfare services. And now, you know, we're not going to let you drop dead in the streets. We want, you know, you, anybody can walk into a hospital, or, or now we want you to have insurance. What do you think about that? I, I think it's right. I think it's, you look, think it is right? Look, I... So one would call you a Democrat. And, and no, no, and, hell no, no, no. Look, there's, there's different things for, for different reasons, right? If we as a society decide that we don't want people dropping dead in the streets or, you know, just dying at home, then there's a cost to that. And we can't expect insurance companies and hospitals just to pick up that cost for decisions we make as a society, just like we want TSA at the airport, just like we want, you know, Homeland Security. You know, should we say, look, don't pay for it. We'll just all get blown up. Right. There's certain minimum services that we've all defined. That's evolved capitalism. Yeah. And we all have to pay for that. But at the same time, that doesn't destroy the root of capitalism and who we are and, and the incentive, right? It just means that we're going to take a chunk off the top. Now, on the flip side of that, how we do that and how you pay for it, that's a different beast. Is the government too big? Yes. Is the government inefficient? Yes. If for every, you know, I'd rather the government have one half the employees and just write checks to people. You know, the old heli helicopter dropped of cash. You know, just drop cash on the people because they're just going to spend it anyways. These are people who can't afford Put to it save. In the economy. Yeah, and so I'd rather, you know, you talk about what would you do as a president. Probably the third thing I would take all these services we mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. and cut. I would say to everybody, okay, here's two years, three years severance, and then I'm going to take 75 percent of what's left and just con consolidate it all together and write everybody who qualifies a check. Right. And then, you know, to go to, you know, you, you have use a lot that, of votes. Yeah. But you use that money. Over, but I, I get crushed by all the unions. Right. Because this, they is anti, be yeah, yeah. They, they, this would be anti. Yeah, they control votes now. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it'd yeah. be very anti-union. Yeah. It would be, you know, it, in somewhat somewhat socialist. And you can argue about creating disincentives mm -hmm. and you'd have to work those mm -hmm. things. But the one certainty is government's too big. 
government is inefficient and there's way to cut ways to cut back on the amount of money you spend. So what does it take to pay for all the services we as a country feel are legit for our citizens, whether it's health care, security, whatever it may be, and what's the best way to do that? And I literally, rather than saying, here's 30 programs you have to sign up for, and here's all the overhead associated with managing those services mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and monitoring and checking for fraud, here's a check. Here's your $800 a month you know, in addition to Social Security. With no accountability. No accountability. No accountability. Right, because now, because you can't get it anywhere else, right? Now, you, this, this has got to take care of your mm-hmm. life. If you don't do it there, sorry. Right. We've eliminated the excuse. So there is a limit to where, listen, if you do nothing with this, there's nothing else we can do. for Right. You. At that point, it makes like, sense. Yeah. At that point, you know, your family's also getting paid. Right. You're on your own. Right. But trying to say, OK, you've got to do this program, this program, this program, this program. It's just so saturated with overhead. It doesn't work. That, that is such an interesting topic. I and that's all off the top of my head, point. right? Yeah. I, I, I know. So w- would you be comfortable with a capitalist like Donald Trump being our president? Um, the capitalist side, yeah, I don't have a problem with it. I like Donald and he's smart. Um, I just, what's concerning is the way all of the, the candidates, Republican or Democrat, are trolling for votes. I mean, they're just pandering. You, what do you What do you want me to say? I'll say it in order to get you your vote. You think he's saying whatever oh, people Oh, hell want. yes. You yeah. think he's saying whatever people want him to say? Pretty much, yeah. Now, wow. within the realm of what gets votes, right? So Within the realm of what, what gets, gets votes, votes right? So, okay. he, yeah, it's not just... What do you want me to say, right? So I need I need to appeal to ultra conservatives in order to get elected in a primary, and so if I'm appealing to ultra conservatives, what do all ultra conservatives want? You know, he started with immigration, that fit. Now, you know, everything he says and does, it's okay. What's the playbook for getting voters for the primary? Now, do I think once he's elected president, he'll follow through for all those with all those things? No, because most of them won't work. And he's and do I think he's smart enough to figure that out and then just do the right thing after he's elected? Yes. So, you know, like a lot of um, candidates and politicians, you vote for not what they say, but knowing that 99 percent of they say won't come true. What they'll do Crap once they get to see it. who's going to follow through with a lot because you well, don't well, really they know can't. anybody. Well, well, you already know he's not going to get yeah. a wall built. Right. He's not going to get all these things done. It's just not going to happen. And there's no money to do it. So slice those off. And what will happen when you just put the guy in the office? So what, what do you think the, the, the American people should ask about Trump as a president? If there's one question, what would it be? Is it the same thing you're saying that do you really think he's going to deliver on all this? Stuff no, because he knows. I mean, look, when, when he, him and all, I'm not, this isn't just Donald, right? This is all, every everyone, one of them. Every sure. single Bernie, one. Hillary, Q, all, Q, both Rubio, sides, everybody. Up, right? sure. Because when they put together their tax plan, oh, we're cutting the tax to all this. We use the number from this tax group, right? It doesn't add up, right? And they say, oh, it's going to cost, you know, $30 trillion over 10 years. Oh, no, the economy will increase so much. Right, right? You, you know it's BS, right? How Just, do you process the vote, though? you got to pick somebody to vote for. How well, do you what process comes out, it? Look, we got 12 months, right? You so, told me nothing matters to late. Yeah, right? right? And so um, we got lots of time, and, um, you know, things will start. Right now, they can play Alice in Wonderland and just throw things up, and it doesn't matter. Right. I mean, because none of their tax plans work. And then Hillary and Bernie <laughs> say, OK, tax to one percent and that'll pay for everything. Doesn't work. Right. Won't work. You know, Hillary's um, pay for college. Her plan is ridiculous. It'll increase college costs, not reduce. You know, so they don't they don't think them through. They just say, OK, here's here's my justification. But over time, they'll have to start thinking them through and they'll have to start dealing and addressing some facts. And then at that point in time, you say, OK, Knowing that none of this is ever going to pass, who's still going to be the best president when it's all said and done? It's going to be very interesting. It'll be, I mean, it'll this be a reality is going to be show. very, very interesting on what's going to happen. So let, let's, do a, let's do a couple of things here with fun, and then we'll go into cyber sure. and wrap it up. Sports, um, you know, Dallas and what happened with our, you know, uh, uh, we can say runaway bride, if you want to call it. Right? Oh, yeah. So, so it, it, runaaway bride, well, what happened with them? If he were to ever call back. This season, let's just say, because uh-huh. my opinion is this. I think if the Clips don't pull it together this year, I think something's going to break apart. That's my right. opinion. I'm just that's, an insurance that's guy. I don't care. Yeah, that's <laughs> if he true. called and said he wants to come and play Dallas, would you ever take him back? No. Never. So that you never out. say never. You never say never, right? Everybody deserves a second chance. Sure. Um, you know, D. Will said no to us initially. 
and we brought him back. Interesting. Right. So, you know, I just care about winning, and I'll, I'll put winning above ego anytime. I notice with guys that get to your level that there's got to be a level. You have a strong memory because, you know, enemies, everyone's got a target. We've got enemies. But there's also a level of forgiveness when it comes down to Yeah, you're here to win. Right. You know? I so mean, it just makes sense that the opportunity arises. Yeah. I why mean, not? Why not? Right. I, I mean, look, it's basketball. It's not thermonuclear war. <laughs> right. It's not like you shot my cousin, you know, or, you know, or just, you know, cut off his pinky. Right. It's basketball. Oh, my goodness. We think sometimes, we, you know, when we drink some of these uh, uh, exciting drinks you got back mm -hmm. here, sometimes we get a little bit more excited thinking it's very, very important. Exactly. Uh, so you think Golden State could go 73-9 and nine this year? Yeah, who knows, right? I hope not, but we'll see. They're we'll looking see. good. Yeah, they're, they're really good. They're looking good very, too. very good. Some fun questions from you. Uh -huh. Favorite type of music? What do you like? Um, Hip-hop. Really? Yeah. Even when you were younger, or was it kind of a thing? Yeah, yeah, classic funk, yeah, hip-hop. Yeah. Hip-hop. So yeah. Tupac or Biggie? Um Probably Biggie. I just like the beat more, and it, it, you know, Tupac was more about you know the message, and, and Biggie was like, let's just party. Favorite decade of music? Um, probably in the '90s, right now. That would yeah. be Biggie's. Yeah. Okay. You got a favorite song you listen to during workout? Um, yeah, yeah. I forget the the band though. It's called I'm a Beast. Who's Emma Beast? Do you know who's Emma Beast? I'm a motherfucking beast. <laughs> uh, I've got it on my phone over there. Yeah, that's how it goes. That's your work oh, out. Beast. I'm a motherfucking beast. Uh, it's like, yeah, it's actually great. Favorite movie of all time? Oh, gosh. I don't have any one. I'm, I'm really into, like, end of the world movies. So my wife always cracks up. So any movie that has, like. Independence Day. Yeah, like, San, yeah, Independence Day. Like, San Andreas Fall was a horrible movie, but the whole place was falling apart. You know, the day after tomorrow I'll watch, you know, um, you name it. If, if the whole world is blowing up, I, you know, and L.A. is crumbling and there's some big old thrust you know, of water, you know, wave of water coming through New York. I'm like, that's why I did Sharknado 3, right? <laughs> end of the world. Uh, are you into cars or not really? No, I'm not into cars. Care I have a Lexus, cars. but I'm not into cars. Got it. Uh, favorite room in a house? I know you're living in a big house. Do you got like a real cool place you built for yourself, like something like this? No, not like this because um, actually my house was perfect when I had no furniture. I mean, I, my buddies came over. I could throw a football. We played wiffle ball. I mean, we had one big inside. Fluffy house, really inside yeah. And what we would do, you know, like imagine, you know, you dive over the sofa so you can catch a pass and you roll off the sofa like you just got tackled. It was perfect. Then I got married. Things <laughs> change when that happens. Real quick. So, um, iPhone or Droid? Both. I carry one of each, two different networks. So if my network is bad on one, I have the other. And I get to test and play with all that. Which do you prefer more? I, it just depends on the app. Really? So you're, you're both. So yeah, what I like about, you be independent is what yeah, you but I like Yeah, but what I like about Android is that um, with Samsung, it has replacement batteries. So I just carry an extra battery. Um, and, but on the flip side, iOS batteries seem to last longer. Um, so there's pluses and minuses to both. So I don't know if you heard him say this. iOS batteries tend to last longer to all my droid friends out there. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about CyberDust. Uh -huh. This has become the app that I check probably the most on a daily basis Good. outside of YouTube. Good. And YouTube I check it because of what we got going on. But right. this is a very, very exciting app. Tell me the story behind why CyberDust. Sure. Um, back in 2013, mm -hmm. um, I had a trial against the SEC. The SEC accused me of insider trading. And in the trial, um, as part of their discovery, they took all my emails. And some of the most innocuous emails, you know, when I wrote them, thought, okay, this is ridiculous. You know, this means absolutely nothing. They would take and they turned them into like, oh, this is proof you did X, Y, and Z. Like I said, um, I had one of my buddies, um, Lee, that is the world's worst stock trader. And I said that in the email, you know, because he asked me about the stock that I was accused of, insider trading, mama.com. And I said, you know, no, stay away from it because I knew he would just lose money, figure out a way to lose money. And I said, in, you know, when, when the SEC asked me about it, I said, no, he's the world's worst, worst trader. And they said, no, you knew this stock was going down and you just said that to protect him. I'm like, that's ridiculous, right? So the simple point, as that. Simple as that. Just... When you're in an adversarial position, whether it's the SEC or any lawsuit, right, uh, if you've ever done a deposition, mm -hmm. right, whatever you say, the other side's attorney is going to try to turn it into something to their benefit. Sure. And, and with emails, with text, it loses context. And when you really think about it, the minute you hit send on an email, 
a text message, a Facebook message, whatever it may be. The minute you hit send, you lose ownership of it, but you don't lose responsibility for it. And we're not talking about just You lose ownership, but not responsibility. responsibility. Very interesting. Right, because if I send you right. an email, you own it now. That's right. Right? If you want to say, you know, when I, if I said, the sky is blue, what an amazing day, you know, and then, you know, something comes out and you say, see, he sent me this email. He doesn't really believe that the sky is green. You know, he may have said the sky is green. He's a liar. Right? See, Cuban's a liar. He, you know, and so you can take anything I send. You know, if... If my daughter um, has a friend who, you know, finds her lost iPad, which would be a calamity, and she says, I love you for this. Thank you so much. You're the best thing that ever happened to me. And some little schmucky little kid says, oh, from Alexis, I have this email, and she says she loves me. See? Right? That responsibility, that context can change forever. That's why I started CyberDesk. Mm -hmm. So from a business perspective, um, I do, I do didn't like the fact that I lost control of all my emails, no matter where they were, since, particularly since I do everything via email um, at the time. Um, I didn't like the fact that anybody could keep it, whether or not I liked it or not, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? From, and, so, and I also liked the fact that because it disappeared, it was like a face-to-face -face conversation. So when you and I talk via Cyberdust, it's like talking here and now. Sure. Except now it's being recorded, but you know, minus the camera. Yeah, minus right. the camera. Because right? even if you take the picture, name doesn't say who the came name from. Doesn't it's phenomenal. But even yeah, but even if you take a screenshot, right? Not only does it not say who it came from, but it sends me an alert. And you know, you talk. If someone were to have a whole group of screenshots trying to reassemble a conversation, mm -hmm. you're going to know something was wrong in the first place, right? Because you're not going to. If, if you want them to save it, you're not going to have that conversation in CyberDust. If I'm sending you something, I want you to save. I'm going to say, I'm, "What's your email?" Right, because you don't you, you use email less. Right, but you know you you still can use email. Here's a contract. Here's you know let's discuss the terms. We need to memorialize. That's great. But for having what would otherwise be in a face to face conversation for anything that is just a business conversation, I'm going to use Cyberdust every time. Um, and so that's why I created it. And when we created it, you know, like anything else, like any other business, I, I thought this would be big for kids, right? It's not, even, it's not kids. It's the post-Snapchat generation that really is into it. People who think in terms of words, people who communicate ideas, you know, as opposed to here's a picture of my lunch. You know, it, it's and kind you of, commented on that with Snapchat because they yeah. just made a very big mistake. They yeah. made a very big mistake. Yeah, they said everything. Say, yeah, 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 and that benefit cyber does. I mean, positioning-wise, that was not a good move on their end. No, and that's okay. I mean, they're they're fine. <laughs> Evan's not worried about anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, we're, we're kind of like, if you will, Snapchat for grown-ups. You know, when once you get past, here's pictures of my Snapchat lunch. Snapchat for grown-ups. Yeah. You know, it, it, for people who understand. So if you only use Snapchat and you're trying to figure out mm -hmm. what it is, right? Because Snapchat's all about pictures. It's not about communications. Mm -hmm. Cyberdust is about communicating ideas. It's a, You know, you can send links. You can send it from one to one person and then um, send it to a 100 or a 1,000 or a million people that follow you. Um, Cyberdust is about being able to have a private conversation. Privacy creates honesty. If we're having a conversation and you and I can talk about politics, and I can be like we did, and I can be brutally honest. And you were. And I was, yeah. right? Because it's not going sure. everywhere. And the minute, if you took a snapshot, a snapshot I'm not talking That's to right. you anymore, right? right. And, and then I can, it's not for me, right? Because it doesn't have my sure. name. Um, so that privacy really makes people a lot more candid. And if, you, and if you're in a big business, as an example, your lawyers will always tell you, you know, write an email knowing that someone else is going to be reading it, and it could be a lawyer from an opposing counsel, right? You don't have to do that with Cyberdust. You can just be honest. And to me, that moves forward the conversation and makes businesses more effective. Do you think politicians, people who are of influence that everything is held against them, do you think people would, you know, public figures, they need to start transitioning away from Twitter to Cyberdust? Would you say that? Oh, yeah, and there's a lot to do. <laughs> they just do it on a private basis. Mm. You'd be shocked at the the A-level names and the people that, that use Cyberdust um, and that have told me and the politicians and, and you know. Um, because I can see that. I mean, oh, yeah, I would, smart. Would, yeah, of course. Smart. You know, 90% um, of our usage is 9 to 5, uh, you know, and so, you know, it, it's putting, doing it on Twitter, whatever. Your whole, whether you're 16, 26, 66, right, everything you do on social media creates a footprint that says who you are. 
anybody I hire, right, that's going to direct report me, I'm looking at Twitter, sure. I'm looking at their Facebook, I'm looking at their Instagram, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm following them on Snapchat, because it all creates a, a profile of who they are. Mm -hmm. And now there's machine learning that's going through and analyzing these things and saying, okay, Patrick is this. And I know that because here's all his social media posts. And it's going to be a whole lot worse if you're 16, 17, 18, and you've got this whole long history. With Cyberless, it's not an issue, obviously. And they're coming out with websites. They're coming out with a way to try to audit you to be able to figure out what you think your opinion yeah, is on course. this. Yeah, of course. There are Every, websites, you algorithms, yeah. everything. Yep. Uh, well, I'll tell you my opinion sure, on please. Cyberdust. So some of the pe people that are watching is, I love Cyberdust. When I first switched to Cyberdust and I started messing with it, the first couple things was, well, you know what? How do I know who the message comes from on group? And all you got to do is hold the picture comes up, which was Boom. great. Yeah. All these different colors, how to know who is this, so I have to do that. Then, uh, uh, you know, the screenshot. You have to learn the screenshot that if you have to get something that you want to save, hey, get this email screenshot, I can save that. Okay, great, that helped me out. But I put it in three different categories. So I use dust as a text, right? that's how I look at dust. Right. I use blast right. as a tweet, is right. how I look at it. Exactly. Why? Because you can send it, but the good thing is I have groups right. on who I can tweet to, right. which is great, blast brilliant. Right. Yep. Then I like the uh, uh, group dust, right. and on the group dust, I can look at that as group me, yep. as group text. It's just private. It's, yeah. it's private, it's, and on group me is becoming very slow, so if I'm, whether I'm running an organization, sales organization, a company, it doesn't matter, I can categorize those three, and it's working amazingly well Good. for me right now. So I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Cyberdust in a major, major way. Um, so plus, like I get, like I follow you on Cyberdust, so I get your motivational mm -hmm. stuff and I'll mm -hmm. blast it a lot, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You get the stuff that I put out there, mm -hmm. whether it's on business or motivation or stuff like that. So, and the cool part about it, when you tweet something, like on your Twitter, on your Instagram, on YouTube, right? No matter what you tweet or put out there, someone's going to bust on you for it, right? There's always going to be a troll that trolls you from one way. And in the back of your mind, you're always thinking, okay, how's somebody going to nail me on this? You never have to do that on, on Cyberdust yeah. because if I say something you don't agree with and you come back and you say, maps suck, well, 30 seconds later, it's gone, right? And I can block you and you don't know it. And, and But the better part is no one else sees it. On Twitter, if they say, well, you know what? You suck, right? Your company sucks. Everybody sees it. That's right. Right? That's and right. you don't want to deal with that knowing that everybody's going to see the response. Very, very good point you just made. I didn't even think about that. So you're not talking about me saying you suck. I'm held to it. Right. You're saying it's a brand. Another person says you suck. Right. I so when I, go search, yeah, when I go search for your company. Very I'm, good point. So when you search for Mark Cuban or M Cuban, my Twitter handle, you see all the people say, oh, you're an idiot Cuban. You suck. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Mm -hmm. Right. I don't put anything of, of consequence on Twitter anymore. Twitter's like a PR news You're one. a lot less on Twitter than you were two or oh, three years ago. It's yeah. not even a question not about it. It's night and day. Not I'm close, noticing right. that. Anything of consequence, I put on Cyberdust and blast it out. Right. And so Patrick says, oh, that was an interesting concept. We can have a conversation, and it's private. Right. On Twitter, if you say something and I'm interested, one, I'm limited to 140 characters. Mm -hmm. Two, we could go to direct message and do it that way, but you could still keep it all, right? Um, three, everybody else is going to see the conversation and is going to jump in and add their own two cents. And so it, it becomes such a public medium that you can't, it, it's no longer social. Whereas with Cyberdust, if 30 people respond to something I blast out there, I can deal with them one-to-one. -one. And if I like something, I can say, hey, would you mind if I re-blast this or you know, screenshot it and send it to everybody? And then if I want to, I can. Mm -hmm. And so you get the best of all worlds. Yeah, I'm, 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 a, I'm a big, big fan of it. You know, We use it in so many. We have everybody in the field get, get use it. And then the interesting thing is the speed is very – It's, it's getting faster and faster and faster. There yeah. was a little bit but like this within a month of change. Every month you're seeing something. We're, we're going to make it better and better. I love it. I'm looking forward to using it a lot more as Thank well. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, I, I have a feeling, you know, I was in front of a group of guys, and I said, guys, go get Cyberdust. Thanks. The challenge sometimes is, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, he got big on YouTube early with right. Wine Library. You had some, some of these Twitter guys with himself. He's got 1.1 million followers, but on Twitter he got involved right off the bat. Right. So well, yeah, I've got he, 4 million, right, and it helped that I was there in 2009, right, right? So right. Mike, my suggestion to everybody is if you're not on, if you, if you don't have a big presence on Twitter, it's Facebook, Cyberdust, it's a lot easier. Go get it big before Cyberdust got right. 100 million users. I'd right. rather have well, it let's get the right. So, but yeah, so if you add yourself, so if you want to get followers and you're looking to build a following, on Twitter, it's really hard, right? 
And, you know, if you've built up, built up a thousand followers on Twitter, it's probably taken you multiple years and half of them are dormant or bots, right? On CyberDust, there are no bots, first of all. And if you add yourself to chatters, then you're going to be able to get followers. And we have a follow Friday like Twitter does, right? And we'll put out there people to follow. Um, but also we're going to be improving our discovery mechanism significantly here over the next two months. And so, because to your point, we want regular everyday people to be able to get a thousand, two thousand, five thousand followers where on Twitter they might have 150 followers and most of those are just follow backs or bots. And so it, they're not really of consequence. So No doubt about it. Yeah. Twitter, they did a number saying Twitter, their biggest criticism is only 24% of users are real. Are real, yeah. Everyone else That's is crazy. not what real think, because yeah. they sell 1,000 fake followers because, you know, now right, they can buy right, fake followers. Right, right, And then, you know, so that's yeah, the part of all Yeah, bots don't work. You can't bot ours. So. You can't bot CyberDust. That's, That's great. Right. That's great. Well, you know, again, Mark, thank you for your time.